Welcome back to the Storytellers Podcast, where we dive into exploring the magic and the mysteries of the human experience through psychology, spirituality, and storytelling. I'm your host, Bella Devine. I am a Mexican mystic, a mentor, a trauma specialist, and naturally a storyteller. And for today's episode, I brought a really dear friend and a special guest. Her name is Mahina Alexander, and she is a Hawaiian mystic. She is a mentor, a mother, a model, and a really profoundly captivating storyteller who I I really wanted to have this conversation with her because she is someone who has really alchemized really deep traumas, which you'll hear all about on this episode, through spirituality. And I think spirituality has been a guiding force through her healing journey. So we'll be talking about how you can utilize spirituality to support you in your healing journey and how to begin tuning into synchronicity, which is really the language of the universe. It's a really special episode, so I hope you enjoy and let's go ahead and dive in. Mahina, thank you so much for being here on the Storytellers Podcast. I would love to begin by asking you a little bit about your story and what led you to become the divine, spiritual, truth bringer, and light being that you are. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you, and I'm really excited for this conversation. Me too. Um, yeah, a little bit about my story. Um, I experienced immense childhood trauma, like uh, so many of us. Um, and growing up, I, you know, had a really young mother and she was on crack most of my life. Mm. And she would, she was very paranoid when I was a kid. So she thought that people were watching us and trying to break into our house. And I was eight years old with a knife in the bushes, ready to kill someone before they killed me kind of thing. Mm. And so I spent a lot of my early years being really afraid that people were watching me out to get me, you know, like I didn't sleep most nights. I would lay on the couch, cover my body in pillows and wrap my whole entire body except my eyes in a blanket and watch CSI Miami reruns because they always catch the killer. (laughs) That's wild. So I was like, if someone's outside and they look in the window, they won't see me lying here kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you can already imagine what that does to a little person's brain to be constantly like paranoid and worried that something bad is going to happen at any moment. And yeah, I my sister was born when I was 10. So I stopped going to school. I started driving. I started caring for a baby really early on in my life and looking back now you know i barely went to school but i had really good grades because i love learning and Mm -hmm. i love wisdom and history her story right and so i see it as a huge blessing now that my life happened the way that it did because raising my sister raising my family members my mom even Mm -hmm. who calls me her mom to this day that gave me a sacred responsibility and it also made it it kind of gave me this push to get to the root of things Mm -hmm. and you know what's really going on here in this human experience and there was a lot of pain that i had to heal a lot of trauma that i had to break through and um i moved away from home when i was 18 i moved to la and i started unpacking it all You know, I kind of started drawing experiences into my life that brought me deeper into that healing and it was unavoidable. And I started seeing 333 everywhere. Mm. It was just like everywhere in the most random places, you know. And so I finally asked my mom, like, what do you think this means? And she said, you were born at 333 a.m. And not only that, but I was really getting to know I had. I have a beautiful elder, my grandma's best friend, who's also my best friend now. She's a triple Scorpio. She's so amazing. And she gave me, she printed out my numerology for me when I moved to LA and I read it on the plane and I was just in tears because I realized that my life path number is a nine. And what that means is that I experience all of the range of emotion and teachings from one through nine. Mm -hmm. And when I was 18, I was in a nine year cycle. Mm. So I was at the end of a nine year period of what I had absorbed. 
And it was like a huge death portal for me. Mm -hmm. The first one that I had done consciously mm -hmm. knowing, wow, there's a universal math to this that's happening to me and through me. And yeah, as I let all of that fall away, more wisdoms kept coming to me. And yeah, so. Were you already spiritually connected at that time? Was your mom spiritually connected? She had you at 15, right? So really young. Did she raise you connected to spirituality or was that more so, I believe your father is the one from uh, Kauai and mm -hmm. he comes from an, uh, an ancient lineage in Kauai, is that correct? Yes, yeah. he does. And did, so which one of them taught you more about spirituality? So this is an interesting one because I was on my own a lot as a kid and it was actually my grandmother from my mom's side mm -hmm. who kept me in touch with magic through my whole life. Mm -hmm. And she's Italian and European, but she gave me my first tarot deck. She gave me hers when I was 13 and taught me how to use pendulums and really encouraged me to stay connected to magic. And so I've always loved stories and movies and mm -hmm. books and films, you know, and it was really that thread that kept me connected to my spirituality. Mm. Okay, beautiful. So yeah. it was kind of like a remembrance that happened when you were 18. And was that the initiation of your conscious, you know, path as a spiritual being and what came afterwards? So I guess I kind of have to start at the beginning with this one because I, this only came full circle for me recently, but it's really profound. So I recently moved into a house about six months ago and maybe a month or two later I was told by my grandma that this was the first house we ever lived in and I had no idea. And I lived in 32 houses by the time I was 18. So for me to move into that house was just interesting. Mm -hmm. And I lived there until I was three and my son will be three this month. So he and I both lived in the same house at the same time. That's wild. And when I, and to bring synchronicities into this, this is probably the biggest one of my life. So I was 18 years old and I was in Radio Shack and a stranger came up to me and recognized my eyes. And he asked me if my name was Mahina Nani, which not many people know that that's my full name, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I said yes. And he told me that when I was two and a half, I had slipped into the river and drowned and that he had jumped in and saved me. Wow. And I was like, obviously super tripped out and crying in Radio Shack with my boyfriend at the time, just like, wait, what? Um, and fast forward to um, a few months ago, I introduced my son to my mom for the first time because I took my time with that mm -hmm. just because of the nature of our relationship. Mm -hmm. And I, we went to the beach together, to Kalihiwai. And somehow the topic of mermaids came up and my mom said, oh, well, you disappeared here for 45 minutes when you were his age. And when you came back, you told me that mermaids were real and that if we ever needed to be rescued, that they could open up this mountain for us because it's hollow. Um, and so then I remembered in that instance when she said that, that I had been living off grid when I was 21, going really deep into the gene keys mm. and really going into the shadow, the gift of the mm -hmm. shadow and the highest truth of that full spectrum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. genetic key, right? And so that's been a huge tool for me. And through that process, my dreams intensified. And I should say that dreams have been the greatest teacher for me. Mm. Beyond any human being in this lifetime, I would say my dreams bring me so much. I'm curious to know, I work with dreams quite a bit myself. Do you have a process to invite your dreams to bring you more wisdom or to ask your guides to communicate with you? Like before you go to sleep, is there any ritual or practice or maybe a dieta that you've tried to enhance your dreams or anything that's supported that process? Definitely Blue Lotus. Mm. I love working with Blue Lotus for that specifically because of the ways that the ancient Egyptians utilized that water lily to open up the third eye. Mm. And yeah, also just journaling all the time mm. and recording myself, speaking to myself and listening back to it was what got me in the habit of going to sleep and then waking up in the middle of the night and recording. Mm -hmm. So when I was living off grid, I woke up, recorded myself in the middle of the night, 
And I s told myself from that space that I was being visited by a whole group of mermaids, like spiritual beings from the etheric plane. And they told me to remember my true name. And they told me, Manavili, 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 remember your true name. A ship came, my lifeless three-year-old body was on it and took me away. And then I woke up. So I put those three things together and I realized that the day I disappeared for 45 minutes from my mom, I had drowned, the man had saved me, and I had had a near-death experience where I was visited by otherworldly beings mm. who reminded me of my true power. Wow. And so to have had that happen was really interesting because right around the time I connected these dots, I saw a Vedic astrologist and she told me that I had a marker for near-death experiences in my chart. Wow. So I found out that I had had a near-death experience and that that near-death experience is why I've recapitulated what I have. Mm -hmm. Like the gathering of wisdom and truth and all these things I think happened because I crossed over at such an early age mm -hmm. and came back. Mm -hmm. So when I was, you know, 13, I started having really interesting powers and visions coming online of like, snow falling from the ceiling and all of a sudden a portal opens up and I'm a Russian man mm. in another lifetime and I'm understanding Russian and I'm toasting my hands around a fire. I've just cut trees down all day, but I'm still in my body and I'm opening my eyes as wide as they can go going, is this really happening? <laughs> so I started searching online. Thank you, Google, <laughs> for what's going on with me right now, you know, and I kept finding like shamanism, shamanism, shamanism and occult mystery and all these things. So, yeah, I found shamanic whale dancing. So I started doing shamanic whale dancing and trying to transmute my dense emotions through movement mm. and sound. And then I found eBay with these CDs on it with like 500 rare occult manuscripts from between the 1500s and the 1800s for $12.99. So I got that CD, put it in my laptop and started studying the consciousness of fire and within the temple of Isis and just really connecting to that like deep, deep wisdom mm. that is within my DNA because I'm born in Hawaii on the island of Kauai and I'm Hawaiian, but I'm also Maori, one of the five original ships of the Maori people. Mm -hmm. I'm Filipino. I'm North, South, East and West African. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really profound to watch those codes wake up in my being mm -hmm. and to have so much in common with so many different types of people mm -hmm. and lineages and cultures and to really like synthesize and weave those refine them, distill them into something very practical, just this way of life. I see so, so many parallels between us. It's wild. Like with your story, first, I want to just say that, you know, I share this identity that I consider you, people like you and me, bridge people. So I am Mexican. I come from this native, you know, Toltec lineage in Mexico. But on my father's side, you know, they people they were people who escaped the Holocaust, who were Lithuanian and who um, were also a little bit Polish, I think. And I have some Lebanese blood. And so I've always kind of felt like I belong to everywhere and nowhere. And my intention, especially when there's all this chaos and um, divisiveness happening in the world, has always been how can I be a bridge wherever there are walls? So I love that you're speaking to that because I do think that it's so important to find that common thread. But I wanted to share a story in response to your Radio Shock story because <laughs> it's like hearing a mirror of an experience I, I had. I remember being coming back from a road trip when my parents were getting divorced and we stopped at one of those like strip malls to get lunch. And I went out to the car early and this woman came up to me sobbing and she's like, Anna Isabella is that your name? That's your name. And I was like, how did you know my name? And she was like, I'm your angel. And she was like telling me all these things about my life. She was like, your life's going to be so beautiful. I love you. Like we're here for you. And then all of a sudden <laughs> I hear my dad and I turn around and I'm like, are you seeing this? And I'm like, dad, this woman just knew my name. And he's like, what woman? And she was gone. And so I wanted to speak to how it feels when you start to have those experiences, when you start to experience synchronicity, which, you know, you're kind of an expert in synchronicity 
synchronicity. You've had so many moments of divine alignment wake you up into who you are now. But when you first start to experience synchronicity, there's this feeling of like out of body. Am I crazy? And I would love for you to speak to, you know, what it was like and how you began to find your community and your people from that kind of isolated place of just starting to wake up. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that I have to thank my Aries energy for too. You know, just like doing it anyways, Mm -hmm. you know, because it gets really hard and it is really isolating when all of that comes online. But I think that one of my favorite parts of integrating that into my life was beauty. Mm -hmm. Like bringing that ethereal beauty and bringing that inspiration from the realms of synchronicity and the magic into my life into my style into the way i express myself Mm -hmm. taking photos taking videos sharing the magic of it was such a medicine for me in that time where it was hard to find words Mm -hmm. um yeah and just also opening up like not being afraid to speak about what's happening to you in those times because tumblr was that for me too yeah it was like i posted everything on there and i asked i answered any question that was asked of me and that's where i began forming bonds with people all over the world and it was those bonds even though they were online helped me to feel a sense of solidarity and community Mm -hmm. even when i could tell that the community i was currently in was gonna fall away Mm -hmm. and not be my primary community anymore Mm -hmm. you know what do you think synchronicity is trying to tell us like what do you think the underlying message is i think that synchronicity is the language of the soul the language of the cosmos i think that god is math (laughs) sacred geometry and when you zoom way out and you view this universe that we're in right now there's a very beautiful fractal sacred geometric pattern that's happening and i think that this day and age with technology and you know this world that we live in where other people's realities are trying to override the reality that we feel coming from within it can be easy to get out of alignment with our truth and out of alignment with that sacred flow Mm -hmm. and so i think that when we follow our heart and we do what's hard sometimes it's easy sometimes it's hard we all know that you know and when we follow that impulse from the inside and we let it guide us forward we start to see the angel numbers because it's our guides telling us you're back in alignment with the sacred flow Mm -hmm. of your path you know Mm -hmm. and you know when we have the deja vu experiences i like to think that it's because before we're born we choose our life we choose what we want to experience and that this form that we come into we pick our parents we pick our lineage all according to the lessons that we'd like to learn and receive in this lifetime and yeah i would agree with you completely i believe that this is earth school and we're here to learn the lessons of this dimension so that we can evolve Uh, I think synchronicity is the universe telling us that we're on the right path. It's our higher self. It's our angels. It's, yeah, just, you know, all of divine love telling us you're, yeah, you're on the right path. I'm curious if there are any, like, big stories of wild synchronicity that, one, shook you to your core, but two, that made you feel like you just had to begin sharing with the world. Like, any that made you kind of stop keeping it to yourself and start really just opening up about it? Yeah. Um, I would say a really big one was going to... So, I came home from living in LA when I was 21, and I was so tired. I was like, I have been doing too much partying. I haven't been taking care of myself. So I moved home. I changed my diet and I got completely sober. And a couple weeks later, 13 elders from all four corners of the earth gathered in one of the homes that I was raised in. So Mm -hmm. there's a little synchronicity there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I, my auntie, whom I'm named after, was invited to be the sit-in 13th elder because 
the Hawaiian teacher who would be coming would have to pop in and out. So my auntie was invited and so was I. And we spent 18 hours a day with these 13 elders from all four corners of the earth. And it was so incredible to experience that wisdom that was like laying dormant inside of me, spoken from the mouth of the elders who I had no idea I was missing so much. Because a part of colonization is that a lot of our parents and elders don't even know how to step through that rite of passage into becoming an elder. And we don't know how to respect that process for them. So it's like we're really lacking on the rites of passage across all ages, in my opinion. And when I sat with them, it awakened a lot within me. And it was there that I met someone who facilitates grandmother ayahuasca ceremonies. And I had no idea what it was. I had never heard of it. um, And I didn't Google it or anything like that. I was just, it felt so right. It was $750 for three days and I had $750. (laughs) I was like, this is it. This is rock bottom. The only way to go is down and then back up again, (laughs) you know? And so it was just this huge letting go moment for me. And um, so a week after this ended, I sat with ayahuasca for the first time and my third eye fully opened. And another synchronicity that was interesting was that we sat in ceremony right where my grandmother had raised my dad and right where my grandmother's home was and in the last big flood that we had on Kauai before I was born she drowned there so her spirit was incredibly present at this place where I would go to die before I die (laughs) you know and so on the last day of being with those 13 elders, it just happened that we went to that place, um, the tarot patch, and he asked me to blow Hoppe up his nose so that he could use my saliva to commune with my ancestors. And then he told me that my grandmother was there and that she said hello. And then he asked me if I'd be taking, sitting with ayahuasca in the next few days. And I said, yes. And he said, just take it slow. You have your whole life ahead of you to do this work. Mm -hmm. Like, don't go too deep Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I listened. And even that was incredibly deep. You know, this medicine is so wise. She's so ancient and so profound. And um, as I sat in this ceremony for three nights, I was in Egypt the entire time. So I went very deep into my lineage, into the original lineage, Mm. you know, and what's fascinating to me about that is just that in Chichua, I think is the language in in Africa. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So not Quechua. Okay. But Chichua. Okay. And in that language, we have we have in Olelo Hawaii the same name for God that mm. they do, which is really interesting What's to me. What's the name? Keakua. Mm. And in Chichua, it's Te Atua. So in Maori, um, it's Te Atua. In Hawaiian, in Olelo Hawaii, it's Keakua. Mm. So there's different translators for the language of our Polynesian mm-hmm. Olelo. But It's fascinating to see how, you know, the lineage of ancient Egypt, of Kemet, is where we all originated from, Mm -hmm. you know. And so that's been a part of that awakening that came through with Grandmother Ayahuasca was like, there is the deepest lineage that spirals out into all these other things. And I'll have to send you a picture of a hieroglyph I took of an Egyptian and a Mayan priest shaking hands because it's gorgeous. Please do. I'll share it. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah, this is a long winded synchronicity, but I, ayahuasca introduced me to my deep, serious, not serious, like this is serious, but serious, the planet, Mm -hmm. serious um, consciousness was what created, you know, ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet Mm. and so it reconnected me with that and the true organic matrix of hieroglyphs and so as I connected in with that it was very clear that I would have to go to Egypt Mm -hmm. right 
And so within the next um, few months, I went to Egypt and it was an incredibly profound awakening for me. Um, it brought so many wisdom teachings and codes online for me. And it was just undeniable that I had trained and prepared and been initiated for many lifetimes for this lifetime now. Mm. And when I returned home, um, I was so deep in all of that wisdom and I was cleaning my room one day and I lifted a shoebox and my Oracle cards fell and Isis was the only one left at the top. And I I was like, oh, okay, she's always present, you know, and it was that was the archetype I was working with at that time to acquaint myself with the wisdom teachings. And I put three blue stones above my head where I slept and I had to go to lunch with my friend Gabriel that day. I was listening to a song called Hope my entire way there. And my auntie texted me and said, I bid for some bid on something for you in an auction and I won it. So come by and pick it up today. So I go there after lunch and it's a statue of Isis from a temple in Luxor or f not from a temple, but from Luxor in Egypt. And at the time I was just getting very deeply in touch with the seven sacred flames prayers and there's seven chakras, seven days of the week. Mm -hmm. So I was very much practicing attuning myself with the powers of seven. And on the fourth ray, it's um, Serapis Bay and the Temple of Compliment is in Luxor in Egypt. The angels of divine compliment are Gabriel and Hope. Mm -hmm. And the stone of protection is Azurite, which was the three blue stones mm -hmm. that I put above my head. Wow. So on that day, Wednesday of the Temple of Ascension, the Ascension Ray, I had put the exact stone of that temple above my head. I had received a gift of Isis from Luxor. You know, it was just wild. That is wild. That was one of the biggest synchronicities I've ever had was just the confirmation that connecting with that deep, deep part of my lineage is exactly where I'm meant to be. Mm -hmm. And to be carrying forth the wisdom teachings of that in alignment with the most immediate culture that I have, which is Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. There's so many similarities, you know? I, what I take from that story is that when you begin to listen to and tap into universal wisdom when you begin to plug yourself in to this earth and her frequency and the cosmos and what it means to be a soul having a human experience you begin to connect to one the morphic or the morphogenic field which is the field where all information of your lineage exists but you know there's also the quantum field where you you can tap into all possibilities and i'm sure there are other fields that we're not even aware of that allow us to plug in and just be in sync um, with everything else that has ever happened right or that is yet to happen um, and plugging into the future is absolutely possible too and so what i take from that is that you must have been so in sync with life and with your path that you didn't even need to think about it. It was just this unconscious or conscious, fully conscious, perhaps unconscious or unconscious, knowing that, you know, that symbolism was just was embodied within you, which is so, so beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask you, what does it mean to you to be a woman of ancient lineage in the modern day? Hmm. I think that it really is about our lifestyle and how we show up for ourselves, what we prioritize. You know, what it means for me is in a world that's so fast moving and fast paced the greatest thing that we can do is move more slowly in accordance with the cycles of the seasons on earth and the galactic cycles of seasons in the galaxy mm -hmm. you know like i think that a lot of us have this fear that time is running out and that there's never enough time and all of this and in my opinion time is just an illusion and I think that the more that we 
tap into the knowing that our ancestors had of these cycles of nature that involve resting just as much as taking action, that's when we really are living in alignment with our truth. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it looks like having a community that also supports that rhythm and that pace so that we have the support and the safety to really move in a good way, mm -hmm. in a beauty way. And I see that across the whole planet right now, even though there's a lot of darkness happening, I do see so many beautiful communities of people. And as those communities of people and their health and their wellness and their beauty way expand, like we're all merging into one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And that's very much a part of my lineage as well is working with the cycles. And it's something I'm always bringing myself more into. I mean, the feminine cycles of our, our blood cycles, even just allowing ourselves to rest and slow down and to call in people who support us in those endeavors is invaluable. And really, even with all of the darkness that you touched on that's been happening in the world. And I think it's been happening for far longer than people realize. Just now there's more attention. There's more um, televisation. There's more, you know, social media covering certain things and not covering other things. And so awareness is expanding. But to me, I really see it as a reminder to like hold your loved ones close and to do more good for others. And I think that's the ancestral way as well. The ancestral way was, was you know, first you learn about yourself and then you, and you are selfish and then you begin to practice selflessness and the community sustains itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And to speak to those cycles, you know, we just the other day we had a Maori elder come and from Aotearoa New Zealand and my auntie and I were in the circle and I'm holding Avitia's hand and my auntie's hand and she looks over at us and she's like you're gonna be leading the ceremony today because you're my elder sisters she's like older than us but the knowing of our lineage says that Kauai is the third eye of mm -hmm. the Polynesian triangle. Mm -hmm. Aotearoa is the feet. So they look to us in general as their elders. Mm -hmm. And so we had to kahea, call out, proclaim ourselves to the womb of consciousness that day. And we led about 50 women and two men into the ocean and we did our chants, we did our oli, our prayers, and we called out to Hina Omoana, the, the womb consciousness within the ocean and the moon. Mm. And we did this beautiful ritual to cleanse the wombs and the hara of the men, right? Because men also have that spiritual center mm -hmm. of everyone across the planet and really send our love and our prayers to everyone at mm -hmm. this time and release anything that no longer needs to be held there. And as we did this, um, these words started coming out of my mouth <laughs> and they said, keeper of memory, keeper of codes, may the salt kiss our skin and awaken our bones. Mm -hmm. And I said that about a hundred times until the energy shifted and lifted and you know, the cleansing had occurred for everyone in the ocean. And then it was awakened child of the womb of light. You have been baptized in the waters of memory mm. and not baptism in the sense of washing away our sins. Right. But baptism in the sense of a renewal of memory mm. and of consciousness in accordance with the blueprint that is organic. Mm -hmm. And it was so powerful because as we're here doing this womb healing, a huge turtle comes up and I glance back behind me and I make eye contact with this woman and we're like, we both saw it, you know, cause it was this huge turtle and they don't come to this beach, mm -hmm. let alone at that time of year when the waves are this big. And so I later met the woman and of course her name was heaven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like at this moment when this turtle came, I make eye contact with heaven. And the reason that turtles are so significant to my people is that 
there are 13 shapes around the shell of the turtle and 28 total. Mm -hmm. Women have 13 moon cycles of 28 day lengths. Mm -hmm. So the turtles are the record keeper of the sacred cycles of the feminine time mm. of womb consciousness wow and then this huge blanket of rain crossed over the whole land and for my people when it rains the prayer has been answered so for the honu to arrive and for the rain to come our prayer was heard and received and as the ocean connects us to all other continents around the world the healing goes off to them mm. And the last thing I'll say about the Honu, about the sea turtle, is that, you know, in Native American culture, they believe that we're on the back of a giant mm -hmm. turtle, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. And our name for Earth in Olelo Hawaii is Honua. Mm -hmm. And the name for turtle in Olelo Hawaii is Honu. Mm -hmm. So Honua mm -hmm. is Turtle Island, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially. Amazing. So for us, as ancient cultures to have so many things like this in common shows me that before this great continent, Pangaea, Lemuria, whatever you want to call it, sank, we were all one people. Mm -hmm. And as this sank and all of these things happened, we all went in our own separate ways. Mm -hmm. And now you and I are here as bridges, mm -hmm. you know, really reconnecting to one another again and being these way showers, watchtowers for people who are ready to weave in deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and being a bridge person can be quite challenging because it involves looking at the people who are hurting you, who are hurting your people, who are disrespecting your land and saying, how can we find common ground? How can we not hate each other and continue to judge and separate? But how can we actually like see each other? And, you know, for the longest time, it was like, in college, I was like such a social justice warrior. I just wanted peace for everybody. And I was angry at the systems that failed people. I was like so deeply hurt. And um, it's so funny because now I'm, I, I really just try to meet everyone. Even, you know, I've worked with people who have very different, much more hateful views than I do. And I believe that if I can help them heal from whatever it is that caused them, to become hateful, then, you know, there is there is a chance. And I've seen people become bridge people and start to make those connections and start to loosen those judgments and all of that separation. But I love that perspective. And I think something that's really beautiful is that all essential wisdom repeats throughout this planet, right? So we have the chakras um, and then we have the nyawis in Peru. And then in my lineage, we have another version of the chakras. And it's, it's always, you know, the seven and, um, yeah, so it's really, really cool. And I think it's the the biggest sign of synchronicity that we can have is that before there was uh, the internet or, you know, these methods of mass communication, when people couldn't be in contact, we ha we knew, we carried it. So I love that theory that, you know, we are all one people and I've never thought about it that way, but that's very profound. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I had a dream once. <laughs> that I was in in my dreams I fly a lot as an owl we call it almakua it's like the the animal spirit that your lineage or you as a personal soul has so in my dreams I'm flying as an owl a lot of the time and same within my journeys and ceremonies in this dream I was flying as an owl and there was a Native American man standing in the middle of the Grand Canyon on this like circular mound that was just coming straight up from the center and he looked up at me and there were these white threads going from earth to heaven and he said mahina remember in the beginning there were f there were six main directions north south east west above and below mm. and so that after i had that dream i got this tattoo because it's the seven hells and the seven heavens and the washing machine, mm. the spiral that we go through as humans to until we find that zenith mm. of going up again. Mm. And that was just such a profound dream for me because so it's like to tie in with the tribes and the separation. When I met with those 13 elders, there was a man named Ilarion Kuyuk from an Alaskan Unangan tribe and his hand 
his name literally means a hand extending outward to the people. Mm. So he's the bridge of his tribe. Mm. And I asked him about the five directions. And I say five because the man in the dream actually said five. Mm. He said there were five main directions because we here are believed to be in the below. Mm. By a lot of ancient lineages, this is considered to be the underworld. Mm -hmm. And then we have the upper world, which we are seeking to bring here. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him about the five directions and he said no one had ever asked him about it before, mm. but that it was indeed true mm. that there was a splitting of the ancient wisdom from the one into the five directions. Mm. And so I found that interesting, especially with the Native American medicine wheel. Yeah, absolutely. Too. I work with the wheel a lot as well. Um, and I've never heard that concept, as, but we do work a lot with, you know, the lower world, the now and the upper world. And I always, in the Toltec lineage, we say that hell is here on earth. Mm -hmm. And it's really about the reality that you create for yourself. And so many people mm -hmm. are afraid of going to hell or what happens after we die. But, you know, suffering is here. So, you know, this is where we kind of get get to transmute it if we if we practice um yeah so beautiful i i'm curious when it comes to other people who are desiring to experience more synchronicity in their life do you have any recommendations for how to begin awakening that um yeah i would say pay attention mm -hmm. pay attention and listen to what stands out for you and um really practice bringing meaning into your moments like paying attention to the things that hurt you the things that make you feel great joy great peace and you know noticing what symbols arise for you are there triangles present when you're feeling joy are there you know really loud noises when you're experiencing chaos like paying attention to the symbolism because before we had language we had symbols you know, and before we had written word, we danced and we sang. Mm. And that's a huge part of my lineage is dancing and singing to preserve the stories. Mm -hmm. And so when we dance and we sing and we tell stories and we take time to write what we're noticing and what stands out to us, it's almost like learning a new language mm -hmm. if you've been cut off from it. Like mm -hmm. if you haven't been living in the way of the poet or the artist, or you've been viewing it as, oh, those are poets and artists. I'm not a poet or an artist. It's like, if you're a human being, you can connect to the poet and the artist that's inherent with the beauty of this experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what's talked about as the beauty way, mm -hmm. right? Noticing beauty, calling in beauty, even in the pain and in the suffering, and really welcoming that mm -hmm. into your experience and honoring it by mm -hmm. putting pen or pencil to paper. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a, such a writer at heart. It's, I think we me both too. connect over that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the beauty way speaks to me quite a lot because it's like when you choose to see it, beauty is all around. Even when there's a lot of suffering, it's like the sun will rise still and a butterfly will come land on, you know, an abandoned lot. And so when you choose to see it and you choose to find the meaning in it and be a meaning maker, really, because you're the one who gets to decide what it means. And when you decide that something means something to you, the universe will begin to speak to you through the language that you kind of co-create. Exactly. It, right? Which is really special. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's such a co-creative process. Mm -hmm. And you can even say, you know, this number makes me feel this. And I would like to be shown this number if I'm in alignment with my bliss, or I'd like to be shown this number if I'm out of alignment mm -hmm. with my bliss. Like you can really play with it and mm -hmm. dedicate certain numbers or certain symbols and sigils to whatever you would mm -hmm. like. Yeah, and the universe wants you to be playful. We were just talking about that before we began recording. The universe wants you to be playful, and you can know this because the universe will reward you with energy when you're having pure, innocent fun. When you're being silly with your friends, you start to feel really, really energized. And so looking to your energy levels to inform what direction to move in so that you can experience more synchronicity and so that you can kind of plug into that cosmic flow of of being one with the universe um, is really, really powerful. And it's such a profound way to practice that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also ask you about 
your journey from maiden to mother because I know that your mom was a young mother, you were a young mother, maybe not as young. What has been your experience with that transition to motherhood? The transition to motherhood was probably my most profound teaching yet. Um, becoming pregnant with my son was a huge surprise and I didn't think I was going to have any children because of how I was caring for all the children in my life already. Um, and so when Risen came, I was in shock. And I was also like, this is the biggest yes I've ever felt. And it and I felt a lot of fear because I could fear I could feel already everything changing. Mm -hmm. Everything changing. And so I knew I was gonna have to let go of a lot. And I also knew that, that 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 last, you know, part of me that was not coming fully into my body was going to have to come all the way down in. Mm -hmm. And there was still a part of me that didn't want to. And so that initiation of becoming a mother brought me into my body, into my bones, you know, and there was a lot that I had been avoiding. I think that at the beginning of a spiritual journey, you kind of can go all the way up in spiritual love and light. And I fucking did that and then came crashing back down into my human. And I was really called deeply into my humanity. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the pendulum always swings. I went really high and then I had to come really low. And it was a powerfully grounding experience of just you know, this body is so important. The nourishment of this body is so important. And as my son came into my body, I was already communi communing with him from other realms and seeing the other forms that he was taking. And so it was a very psychic experience with him. And we, he and I have been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I... I had another lifetime with a teacher named Mina who taught me everything I knew to prepare me for this life from ancient Egypt. And after Risen was born, we were coloring one day and I wrote our names on a paper. I said, my name's Mahina and your name's Risen. Can you say what your name is? And he said, my name's Mina. Wow. And I was like, wait, so you were my teacher in another lifetime and you taught me everything that I know? He said, yep. <laughs> wow. And he's very much like that. Like he is so wise and so tapped in. And I feel so honored to know that he's not my child or like my belonging. Like he is a soul that I am honored to guide in this time of development for him. But he is an ancient being mm. and he does the funniest stuff, you know, like what we left my grandparents house and it was a perfectly clear night, no clouds in the sky. And he goes, we have to leave. It's going to rain. I just saw the lion. I'm like, <laughs> what lion? I'm like, wait, what'd you say? He's like, then he talks to me like, I'm dumb, right? He's like a two-year-old and he's like, we have to go. <laughs> it's gonna rain. I just saw the lion. <sighs> like, <laughs> like so oh, rolls his eyes at me, put him in his car seat start driving down the road, turn onto the highway. He's already asleep and it starts torrential <laughs> downpouring, you know? And then the next day, like he starts talking to me about Panthers and I'm like, I'm tuning in with Panthers in my spiritual practice, but I'm not talking to him about it at all. It's something I'm doing in my own practice. And he goes, I just saw the Panthers. And I'm like, how many Panthers did you see? He's like, I saw two Panthers. Where did you see the Panthers? In the light. Wow. And even when he was like, not even one yet, he would look into the corner of the room and say, hi. And just start talking to someone whom I couldn't see, you know? And I did the same thing at his age, my grandma mm -hmm. told me. Mm -hmm. So it's just really beautiful to witness him and also to feel capable of letting go of what I think he needs to be a functioning human and allow him to inform me mm -hmm. of what he needs to become the human that he is destined to be, you know? So just 
walking through the forest with him. I speak light language in his presence and now he's starting to speak light language and we go to places and if the energy's off, we start doing light language, we start singing, the energy of the space will lift. And last time we did this, he found a seven foot long stick that was like three inches around, huge stick, and he's really strong. He's been off the chart for height and weight since he was about four months old. Mm -hmm. And he's really a big person. He stands like a man, he talks like a man, like he's intense. So he picks up the stick and he's like, speaking light language and then he's like in the sky and he's pointing this stick in the sky like lightning's gonna hit it you know what i mean and then he looks at me and he says this was not an accident like what two-year-old says this right then he goes watch out everybody and it's just us there and then he swings the stick around three times and hits the ground three times mm -hmm. and then just looks back at me and says this was not an accident and did he ever explain it any further? So the womb healer who I told you about that I did the ceremony with, I spoke with her about it because she's an intuitive and she and I come from the same star. So we have mm -hmm. a very strong connection. And she told me that what happened to him in my womb, because he was 10 pounds, he was 9.6 when he wow. was born. He was so big and he came out like Atlas ready to hold the whole fucking world on his shoulders, you know. So his arm broke right here between the shoulder and the elbow just snapped in half so he didn't have a pulse he didn't he wasn't breathing for about five minutes so that was kind of like his near-death experience you know and it was a huge thing that happened a lot happened around that and i was worried that um there was some womb trauma that we were going to have to really work at healing and we have in a lot of beautiful ways mm -hmm. that bonded us so purposefully and so when she went into my energetic field and did the Oli to connect with my auric field, she told me that she saw me in a forest. And the forest that she described was the forest we were in when mm -hmm. that experience had happened. And she said that that day was the day that he cleared his womb healing. Oh, wow. So she confirmed that he knows what needs to be done and that by me holding this space of almost like uninformed space like holding an open space and being willing to be a channel and just not knowing not planning like a lot of what i do with him is spontaneous oh we need to go here right now mm -hmm. like making room for that you know at least some days in the week and when we show up there he and i hold that space he can perform the healing for whatever he needs mm -hmm. That's so powerful from the perspective of someone who studied trauma and psychotherapy and specifically ancestral and childhood trauma. You're doing everything right. <laughs> I was really lucky to not have my intuition invalidated either. I saw angels when I was a little girl and my grandmother would proudly take me to the dentist and say, my little girl sees angels in your waiting room. And Mexico people are very spiritual. So he would be like, oh, great. This place must be what blessed. Did they say? And, yeah, he was like, yeah, he was like, oh, tell me more. Um, so, you know, I was really lucky because my whole experience in childhood was very visceral and i know those experiences were real even though my mom my mom couldn't see it right she really held that space and um the best thing you can do for your child is to not invalidate their intuition and like children are our great teachers they know how to process their trauma inherently if they are upset and they need to move something they will throw a tantrum and then five minutes later they will get up and they'll say okay you know what i want to go get ice cream and it's done right and as adults when we're taught that like to be mature is to keep everything constricted and to hold it in and that's when we have those moments of like lashing out or falling into really deep dark places because we don't give ourselves that permission to be in the body to dance and to chant and to use breath movement and sound the way that we do in you know these ancient lineages so that's so awesome and I love, love, love to hear that. It's really inspiring for other moms, I think, too, because there's so many people telling moms, and I'm sure you've experienced this, this is how you do it, this is how you don't. And um, I can imagine that's so overwhelming, even at, especially as you're experiencing just such a massive identity change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mahina, what would you like listeners to take away from this conversation? What's like a message from your heart that you would really like to share? I would say that 
What I've learned so far on this journey is that each human journey is so personal and so unique to each one of us and there's no right or wrong way to do it so long as we're in communion with the truth that is inherent in each of us mm. and taking time to be in nature and to be with beautiful people the ones we love and have fun play sing dance and don't be afraid to you know let things change because even when it changes into something that could be perceived as negative, it will change again into something that is so beautifully for you that you will be grateful for the hard times too. You know, mm -hmm. leaving, making the decision to transition out of my relationship with my son's father into a friendship with him. Now we can be so much closer in this phase of our life where we're just really still getting to know who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. We're both incredibly present in our son's life and we have so much love between us. And all I want is for my son to feel loved and to be guided in love and to have a good example of love. And that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just not doing it in a way that makes sense to a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know? And so even in the face of other people's projections, so long as you prioritize kindness, humility, connection, and respect for your partner, for your friends, you're right on track. Mm -hmm. And it will look strange to a lot of people because you're listening to your own unique internal knowing mm -hmm. and it's guiding to you, gui it's guiding you to places that are for you. Mm -hmm. not for everyone mm -hmm. so it doesn't need to make sense to anyone but you and the people that you love mm -hmm. amen to that absolutely it's such a beautiful beautiful note to end it on thank you so much thank for coming you. on the storytellers <laughs> podcast i love you you I are such a you. light beam and there was so much wisdom shared in this episode for those tuning in i will link all of mahina's socials so you can find her below and if you would leave a review if you'd like to leave a review for the podcast you can send my team an email at hello at bella divine.com and we'll send you a free meditation as a thank you thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode episode.